What's wrong? You were expecting something different? Now, go and find Sokolov and get him out of there. Listen up, Snake. Keep in mind that this operation is strictly covert. Engagements should be avoided. If you must dispose of an enemy, do it with the tranquilizer gun. Yup. Sweet dreams, Boy Scout. That's right. And by the time he wakes up, you and Sokolov will be safely out of the country. Sipping hot coffee on a plane back home. What did you say? Hmm? What did you say? Sipping hot coffee on a... You're gonna drink that foul mud on the victory flight home? Okay, then. What would you drink? Tea, of course. Major, what kind of place is this secret design bureau that Sokolov is heading? Hmm. The Soviets have a number of secret design bureaus like this one, each engaged in cutting-edge research. OKB-1, the bureau where the Voskhod spacecraft was developed and which plays a leading role in the Soviet space program, is one of those installations. Most of them are located in secret cities built in isolated areas, and we don't even know their exact locations, much less the nature of their research. And Sokolov's OKB-754 is the most secret bureau of them all. The intelligence communities of the West have tried time and again to find out what they're working on, but they failed consistently. So you have absolutely no idea what Sokolov is developing? We've got nothing. Then how did you get the information for this mission? It can't have been from Sokolov. From the boss. The boss? That's right. She has her own intelligence channels that she cultivated during the last war. She shared what she learned with us. But we were able to get the green light for this mission at all as thanks to her pull with the powers that be at the CIA. In other words, this mission would never have come together without the boss's help in a number of respects. In the two years since Sokolov's asylum operation, I've spent all my time making preparations. And now is the time to show some results. FOX is a next-generation espionage organization designed to update us for 21st century operations that I propose to the CIA. FOX sends individuals who excel in espionage and special tactics on solo sneaking missions like this one. A next-generation unit that combines the skills of special forces units like the SAS and Green Berets with the know-how of an infiltration and espionage unit. Military politics never was my strong suit. What I'm trying to say is... Stealth. This is a stealth mission, crucial to the coming Cold War. The CIA director has always frowned upon Fox, but if this mission succeeds, Fox will be added to the CIA as an official unit. I intend to make Fox the leader in special operations, and to that end, this mission must succeed. Right. I'm counting on you, Snake. Major, tell me about Sokolov's past work. Hmm. I assume you already know that Sokolov was the developer of the multi-engine cluster. The multi-engine cluster is exactly that, a system for fitting a single rocket with multiple engines. The Vostok rocket, for instance, had 32 engines. With the technology they had, it was difficult for the Soviets to develop large engines with massive thrust. So instead, they decided to focus on using multiple smaller engines to achieve the desired thrust. With this method, though, maintaining the fuel balance between the various engines was a major problem. Sokolov was the man who provided the solution. And that's what earned him the job as the head of the design bureau? Apparently so. So this secret weapon is some kind of ballistic device? Well, that's my best guess. We don't know for sure, but... You'll find out soon. As soon as I get Sokolov out of here. I'm counting on you. Part of your mission is to demonstrate to the brass the core concepts behind Fox. Leave no evidence. That's the essence of Fox. And avoid engagement with the enemy. Understood. Not only that, I mean leave nothing behind, including weapons, equipment, footprints, sweat, even bodily waste. Yeah, when I do my business, I bury it good. What? What's wrong? That's the American way. American way for what? To handle defecation. You're going to bury it? Yeah. Bring it home with you. What? That's what we did in SAS. Mm. The US Army is sloppy. They do things well, but not perfectly. Here in Fox, we're doing things my way. Got it? Yes, sir. Major, didn't you say that the boss was in the SAS with you? Yes, we formed the 22nd SAS Regiment together. 
When the SAS, the British Special Air Service, was first established, they invited the boss on board as a special advisor. In fact, you might say it was the boss who put together Rayforce and L Detachment, which laid the groundwork for today's SAS. You won't find her name in the history books, but her contributions were many and great. Yeah, the real heroes are never made public. Not in our line of work, anyway. The dummy run on Heliopolis and the nighttime raids on German air bases in North Africa were her idea as well. Yes, she was always one step ahead of the rest of us, both in thought and action. It's true what they say. Who dares wins. The motto of the SAS. Precisely. The motto itself is a tribute to her service. Needless to say, the SAS has become a model for special forces units all over the world. In that sense, the boss really is the mother of special forces. Major, what about my code name? You mean Naked Snake? Yeah, what does it mean? It's because snakes slither through the grass unnoticed to those around them. No, I mean the naked part. It means without embellishment, devoid of a specified quality. In other words, basic. Why is that my code name? I explained that the Virtuous Mission is designed to test the effectiveness of Fox, right? Right. And the procedure used for this mission will represent the modus operandi of Fox for future missions. In other words... The essence of Fox. Naked and pure. Exactly. And there's the fact that you went in practically naked. No weapons, no equipment. I see. Means more than I realized. Yes, clever, isn't it? But don't leave yourself naked to the enemy. Roger that. Snake, I've completed the double check on the Fulton recovery system. Any problems? None. Leave your recovery to us. Excellent. I suppose I should explain the procedure once more before the actual maneuver. No. I see. Well, the Fulton recovery system allows for rapid recovery of personnel from enemy territory, and it's perfect for these kinds of special operations. <sighs> Basically, how it works is the plane flies by and snags a nylon lift line that the soldier has grabbed onto and that's been elevated by a balloon. The Fulton recovery system was first designed in the 1940s as a method of picking up mail for the American Postal Service. During the Korean War, that system was redesigned to recover personnel. Jack, an ancillary organization to the CIA... Yes, good old Jack. It stands for Joint Advisory Commission Korea. Isn't that something? Hmm. So... Jack first used the Fulton surface-to-air recovery system to extract agents from North Korea and mainland China. Let's go over the procedure once more, to be on the safe side. First, the plane drops a canister about the size of a coffin to you. Inside, you'll find a balloon, a 1,500-foot cable, and a harness that attaches to your suit. Take the items out, attach the line to your suit, fill the balloon with helium, and send the line up. The plane will approach at 125 miles per hour. Snag the cable just below the balloon with a hook on the nose of the aircraft and whisk you away. Assuming the pickup is successful, you'll be reeled in with a winch and pulled to safety into the rear of the aircraft. Got it? Hmm. Snake? Yeah, I got it. I got it real good. Were you listening? Yeah. All right, then. You did an excellent halo jump. Not really. I didn't land in the right spot. A jumper who lost his pack on the first real halo jump. That'll make a good story for you. Who cares? There are no records of your operations. I know, but... What, you're embarrassed? No, I'm not embarrassed. It's the boss, isn't it? Yeah. What about the boss? Nothing, paramedic. Doesn't sound like nothing. Nothing to do with the boss, I mean. It has something to do with the boss, but you don't want to say so. Yeah, kind of. I understand, Snake. The boss has done a lot of work on the military study of halo jumps. And Snake here wanted to give a perfect performance on the first real jump. You know, to show respect to the mother of the technique. Major! Snake, uh, I thought you were over and out. Uh... Wow, is that right? You got something to say. No. I bet you do. Mm, not really. I just think it's kind of sweet of you to think like that. I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or an insult. It's a compliment, Snake. So tell me, is it true? What? Not that. Is it true that the boss really worked on research for Halo jumps? Oh, that. Yes, it's true. Halo stands for High Altitude Low Opening. 
It's a jump technique developed for covert insertions into enemy territory, just like the area you're in. A plane flies at 10,000 feet or above to avoid detection by ground forces, and the jumper free falls until he's within a 1,000 foot altitude above the target area, when he finally opens his chute. By using this technique, the chances of revealing the parachute landing to the enemy are marginal. The halo technique was originally developed in France. This was partly due to popularity of parachuting as a sport since the end of World War II. And the boss was an instructor for the research that was carried out there. In 1957, at the JFK Special Operations Center at Fort Bragg, the boss was invited to instruct at the first ever US military halo school. Of course, none of this is on the record, but she's the mother of modern day special forces. Major, tell me a little bit more about the space race. In 1957, the Soviet Union succeeded in launching their first artificial satellite, Sputnik, into orbit. Having been beaten to the chase by the Soviets, the US government accelerated its own space program in an effort to catch up. The following year, the space development programs of the various service branches were united to form the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. That same year, the Mercury program was launched with the goal of putting a man into space. Seven candidates were chosen from the military as the first astronauts. These were the men with the right stuff. But as you know, it was a Soviet cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, who made the first successful manned space flight three years ago. NASA's first successful ballistic flight came one month after Gagarin's mission, with the Freedom 7 carrying Alan Shepard into space. After that, with America still lagging behind the Soviets in orbital flight, President Kennedy made a momentous decision. That America would put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Yeah, I heard that speech. But a lot of guys I knew weren't real happy about it. They said no one was going to make them go on a mission to blow up some damn moon base. But rocket research and missile research are closely related. Imagine, if you will, a Soviet Union able to send wave after wave of nuclear missiles raining down on Washington from a base on the surface of the moon. Even if that's still a long way from reality, if we lose the initiative, we may never get it back. We're left with no choice but to keep moving forward one step at a time. The Gemini program launched two years ago represents the initial step towards establishing a moon base. And yet, I don't want to call President Kennedy a liar, but I simply can't imagine that in six years, man will have reached the moon. I don't know. I never even thought we'd make it up into space. I guess it all depends on whether you have the will to make it happen. Perhaps you're right. Paramedic. What's up? Are you a medic or a doctor? I'm a well-respected physician, or I was until I joined the CIA. How is your reputation? My what? Your reputation. Oh, that. How was it? Why? Don't you trust me? That's not what I meant. Fine, then. Uh-huh. So? So what? Your reputation. How was it? My! You're relentless! Hey, I'm a snake. So? My reputation was spotless. I'm highly skilled, patient, and good-looking to boot. Everybody wanted to see me. What else would you expect? Hmm. No, seriously. Incidentally, her nickname back then was Quack. Major! Is that true? Hmm, is what true? About your nickname. No! Well, maybe a few people did call me that. So you were a Quack? No. Well, yes and no. I mean, in a sense I was, but then again I wasn't. <laughs> Snake, her skills as a doctor are beyond reproach. You have my word on that. Yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say, Snake. Then why did they call her Quack? It's because she... Never mind that. It doesn't matter. We've got a job to do and we have to stay focused. Besides, my past doesn't have anything to do with the mission and... Because she never shuts up. Yes, that's it. No, that's not it. Snake, tell him that's not true. <sighs> say something. I'd better get back to the mission. Yes, you do that. Just a minute. Snake, don't you hang up on me. If you have any questions about stamina or healing, just ask me. I'll tell you everything you need to know. It'll have to be over the radio, though. So you won't be able to see me naked, then? Yeah, I'm devastated. 
But I'll bet that 50 years from now you'll be able to see who you're talking to on the radio. I'll be retired from active duty by then. I don't know. Somebody somewhere might just decide to give you a call. Wouldn't surprise me. Let's both pray that never happens. Say, Snake, about that helmet and oxygen mask you took off right after you parachuted in? Oh, those? Those are the helmet assembly and oxygen system assembly I used to make the halo jump. The helmet is fitted with a bayonet fastener that attaches to the oxygen mask. It's also got earphones and a boom mic. I'm not interested in all that stuff. So why did you bring it up? It reminds me of something. Reminds you of something? Yeah. The mask? Yeah, but I can't remember what it is, and I can't stop thinking about it. That's what you've been thinking about? Yeah, every time I'm about to remember it, it slips away from me again. Don't you just hate that? Mm-hmm. I know I've seen it somewhere before. Any ideas? How would I... That's it! What? The fly! The fly? Yeah, it finally came to me. You look just like him. Oh, I feel better. The fly? From the movie, The Fly? You've never seen it? No. Jeez, where have you been? It's about this scientist who's conducting teleportation experiments when he gets mixed up with a fly and ends up with the fly's head attached to his body. Never heard of it. Mm, that's too bad. It's a good movie. In my day, I did my share of sneaking into enemy territory. You mean since World War II? Yeah. Mostly snatch missions. Snatch mission? That's where you abduct an enemy officer without killing him, right? Right. That's where I got the original idea for CQC. In a snatch mission, taking out the target's escorts by shooting them is not an option. If the enemy hears the gunshot, they'll know there's an intruder and tighten security. And the target will sense danger and try to get away. You needed a way to take out the guards and secure the target without making a sound. That was the idea. The CQC style that you and I developed is based on the techniques I cultivated during those missions. So... First time I've heard this. Huh? You've never told me any of this before. I didn't? No. Why? Hmm. Why didn't you tell me this before? Why now? I have my reasons. Hunters have known about camouflage since ancient times. But it's only quite recently, since the 18th century, that it's been applied to military operations. The first camouflage introduced to the military was a solid-colored uniform designed to blend in with the battlefield. It was really more of a protective coloring than true camouflage. Camouflage, in the modern sense of the word, wasn't introduced until the First World War. During that war, weapons such as aircraft, cannon, and warships were painted in camouflage colors. But it was almost never used to disguise individual soldiers. The widespread use of camouflage began in World War II. The Germans and the Russians in particular made active use of it in battle. Nowadays, with the Cold War raging, the Eastern Bloc has been hard at work developing all sorts of camouflage patterns. In the West, the French implemented it in their paratrooper corps, an SAS during the Wars of Independence in Indochina. I never saw it used in Korea, though. America has lagged behind other countries in incorporating camouflage. They're only just beginning to consider introducing it into certain units. Why is that? Apparently, there are those in the U.S. military who consider camouflage too passive a technique. Morons. You're telling me. But now more and more people are beginning to appreciate how useful and important camouflage can be. I'm sure the brass will see the light soon enough. In the jungle, it's absolutely crucial to keep your position secret from the enemy. Sometimes even the smallest sound can be enough to give your position away and get you killed. You'll have to make sure your weapons and equipment don't make noise bumping around. Use tape to secure metal objects and other items that seem likely to produce noise. After you've secured your gear, jump up and down to see whether it makes a sound. Don't worry. I remember the drill. There is one weapon greater than any other in battle. Do you know what that is? Yeah. What? Do we have to go through this again? Yes. Will. An unflinching will to survive no matter what. Exactly. 
The will to carry out your mission and return home alive will see you through even the most desperate of situations. It's the most potent weapon in your arsenal. Don't forget that, no matter what. If you want to survive in the jungle, you're going to need to hone all of your senses. An unnatural movement in the undergrowth, a tiny shadow peeking out through the trees in the distance. Always keep an eye out for any signs of the enemy's presence. Your sense of hearing is equally important. Visibility is poor in the jungle, so you've got to learn to pick up the enemy's presence from the sounds you hear around you. Always be listening for that one snap of a twig among the chirping of the birds and the babbling of the brooks. Your sense of smell is also important. Body odor, sweat, gunpowder, food. These faint smells wafting in the wind will tell you where the enemy... Uh, no. No? I can't smell. You? What now? I can't smell. Not at all? Nope. Not even a little bit? Not a thing. Oh. Well then, you'll just have to trust in your instincts as a gamer. Tell me, what's the advantage of a solo sneaking mission? It's easier to go in undetected than with a group. Exactly. And therein lies the entire reasoning behind this virtuous mission. This mission into Soviet territory is a violation of international law. If this gets out to the public, we'll be faced with an international crisis even greater than the one four years ago. Four years ago? The U-2 crash. Failure is not an option. Not a problem. I'll get Sokolov out without them ever knowing I was here. Snake. What's up, boss? Don't you what's up me. Okay then, what is it? I'm talking about your camouflage. Why aren't you using it? Oh. When you don't use any camouflage at all, you stick out like a sore thumb. Didn't you listen to a word I said? Well, I was listening, uh, but... Then start using your camouflage. Oh. Is that clear? Yeah. Major. What is it? It's about your code name. Major Tom? Yeah. Where'd you get that name? From a tunnel. A tunnel? That's right. Snake, have you seen the movie The Great Escape? No. It's a movie about a determined group of allied POWs trapped in a German POW camp who plan an escape. The POWs dig three tunnels for their escape. They named them Dick, Harry and Tom. I see. So Tom was an escape tunnel. Did they make it? Out of the camp? Of course. One of the tunnels was even discovered before it was finished. But eventually they do make it out. I get it now. So Tom was the tunnel they used to escape. Uh, yes, that's right. What is it? Um, well, actually, I, I'm not sure if I remember correctly. Major. Oh, it's all right. It's uh, Tom, Snake. Tom is the escape tunnel. Yes, no question about it. Hmm. Paramedic. Hmm? You said you like movies, right? I love them. About the Major's code name. Major Tom? Yeah. He sounded like he wasn't sure whether or not Tom was the name of the tunnel that worked in The Great Escape. So I heard. So was it? Was it what? Was Tom really the name of the tunnel that worked? Right. So it was Tom. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Why don't you know? Why should I know? You watch a lot of movies, don't you? Yeah. But you've never seen The Great Escape? No. Why not? It didn't look interesting. You don't watch movies that don't look interesting? That's right. And yet you've seen The Fly. The Fly looked interesting, and it was. Hmm. Something wrong. Nothing. Tell me, what other kind of movies do you like? Let's see. There's The Quarter Mass Experiment, and It Conquered the World, and Earth vs. the Spider. Oh, and Mondo Kane. Hmm. Did I say something weird? Forget it. Hmm. Snake, are you wearing that mask again? Yeah. For some reason, it feels kind of nostalgic. Yeah, well, um, for some reason, I don't like it. Why not? Something about that face just rubs me the wrong way. It looks fine to me. But if you hate it that much, why'd you give it to me in the first place? Well, that mask was originally created for use in another mission. An agent was supposed to disguise himself as a Soviet officer and sneak into an enemy installation. 
We had it all set to go, but certain circumstances forced us to abort the mission. With the mission cancelled, the mask was going to be thrown away. But the guy at the CIA's tech division who created it pitched a fit. Why'd he do that? He said it was too good to throw away. Yeah. According to him, that mask is a revolutionary new design that lets the wearer blink, something that wasn't possible up till now. I'd think you'd want to make the lips move before bothering with the blinking. Yes, I thought so too, but for some reason he's obsessed with making it blink. Whoever he is, he sounds like a crackpot. Hmm. Well, he does good work, but I spend three days a month just dealing with the complaints we get about him. Oh well, never mind. Anyway, I decided to put this mask we had in storage to good use by hiding your identity from the gunship crew. I get it. So this mask is based on a model somewhere. That's right. What do I do if I meet that guy? That's not going to be a problem. Why not? The man the mask is based on is a GRU officer. You're in the KGB's sphere of influence. Chances are you won't run into him. And if I do... Beat the crap out of him. Major, you said the enemy was KGB, right? I did. What unit are they from? The 6th Directorate? No, the 9th Directorate. The 9th? Yes. But I thought that was... Exactly. It's the unit that protects the Kremlin and provides bodyguards for high-level VIPs. But they're assigned to protect party and government figures. I thought that only meant high-ranking officials and their families. And now they're being sent out to stand watch over a field exercise? That's the idea. What's really going on? I don't know. <sighs> what I do know is that the director of the Ninth Directorate is a well-known protege of Khrushchev. The Premier may have wanted to assign this mission to someone he knew he could trust. So he can't trust any other units? Ever since the withdrawal from Cuba, Khrushchev's position has been getting weaker day by day. This secret test is an act of desperation by a cornered man. If nothing else, the completion of Sokolov's new weapon in this test should help re-establish Khrushchev's authority in Moscow. So what you're saying is, there's also a good chance that whoever doesn't want to see that happen is going to try and interfere. Most likely, Khrushchev must have anticipated this and sent his most loyal unit, his trump card, to make sure that all goes well. Snake, if you or one of your comrades is wounded in battle, what do you usually do? I call for a medic. What if there's no medic nearby? I don't even want to think about that. Think about it. That's my worst nightmare. Any soldier can perform basic first aid, but it takes a specialist to perform the more complicated procedures. I know a lot of guys who'd still be alive today if they'd had access to a medic. Me too. So I got to thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could parachute medics into the front lines where they're needed most? You bet. That's why you're called paramedic. Yeah. With a unit like that, we could save a couple of lives, huh? No. No? Not a couple. We could save many lives. Thanks. I think the army needs a unit like that. And if no one else will do it, I'm going to create one myself. Sounds like a plan. Will you help me? Count on it. Snake, do you know what epinephrine is? What's with the questions? Well, do you? No. Also known as adrenaline? Never heard of it. Really? Nope. I have. Good for you. Do you want to hear about it? Not really. Oh, I think you should hear about it. Here we go. So, epinephrine is a type of hormone. It's secreted from the adrenal glands in high-stress situations, like when you're exercising or you're under pressure. The epinephrine is released into the bloodstream and stimulates special receptor cells on various organs throughout the body. This causes the heart to beat faster, the blood vessels to constrict, and the respiratory passages to expand. It also raises blood pressure. You ever notice how you're faster and stronger than normal when you're under stress? That's because of epinephrine, and when you're bleeding, it... Paramedic. Yeah. Is there a point to all of this? Of course. In the alert phase, your body secretes epinephrine, and so your stamina won't be depleted as fast. Uh-huh. There. Good thing I told you, huh? As always. Snake, stay alert. The KGB and Gru both have their sights set on Sokolov. Gru is a military espionage outfit, the intelligence wing of the Soviet Defense Ministry's General Staff Office. It competes with the KGB, which is under the Ministry of Internal Affairs, 
and the two are always watching each other. Never let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Exactly. Now, added to that rivalry, there's a vicious power struggle going on between the Khrushchev faction and the anti-Khrushchev faction. So Khrushchev is using the KGB, and Volgin and the anti-Khrushchev forces are using the GRU? That's the idea. The two factions are fighting over Sokolov. We're in an extremely dangerous situation here. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Get Sokolov out of there safely. He must not be turned over to the KGB or to the GRU. Sokolov took off in the direction of the rope bridge. Get after him. Hurry! Major, have you been able to contact the boss? No. You really think it's bad reception? We're looking into it. Major. Snake, you've got more important things to worry about than contacting the boss. Right now, Sokolov is out there wandering around the jungle alone. What are you going to do if he gets caught by the enemy? <sighs> We're still looking into why we lost contact with the boss. I'll let you know as soon as we find anything out. In the meantime, it's your job to find Sokolov and get him to safety. Got it? Major, do you know anything about this Gru Colonel Sokolov was talking about? Yes. Who is he? A most dangerous man indeed. His name is Yevgeny Borisovich Volgin. His code name in the West is Thunderbolt. He's gained a reputation as the most brutal and cold-blooded of the Soviet spymasters. During the war, Volgin was assigned to the domestic branch of the NKVD. He was stationed in the rear of the Soviet line to catch and punish any troops who tried to retreat or desert. He's also notorious for his accomplishments in anti-guerrilla operations in the Ukraine and the Baltic states. Apparently, he likes to boast that he disposed of over 100,000 anti-communists. We also know that he was instrumental in putting down the 1953 insurrection in East Germany and the 1956 uprising in Hungary. He is truly a fearsome man. There's no telling what he might be plotting. Be careful. I will. Major, what's this Grand and Design Bureau Sokolov was talking about? OKB-812. It's the same type of top-secret facility as Sokolov's own OKB-754. The director is a man by the name of Alexander Leonovich Granin. He's Sokolov's arch-rival, and the two have competed fiercely against each other since the days of the war. To hear Sokolov tell it, though, the rivalry was really all in Granin's head. In any case, Granin seems to harbour an unusually intense hatred for Sokolov. Knowing that Sokolov was protected under the aegis of Khrushchev, Granin threw in his lot with Volgin, the vanguard of the anti-Khrushchev movement. Apparently, Granin meant to use the funds provided by these opposition forces in order to defeat his old foe. Volgin, for his part, was intrigued by the possibility of using the high-tech weapons Granin created in the fight against Khrushchev. Thus, the two formed an alliance, and Volgin took the Granin Design Bureau under his control. But now Volgin's got his sights set on Sokolov. Yes, it would seem that he and Granin aren't getting along so well after all. By the way, Snake, what were you doing back there? Back where? You were giving some kind of advice to a Gru commander, weren't you? Yeah. He's your enemy. What the hell were you thinking? Really? What was all that about doing the thing with your hand on the first round or whatever? Whenever he put a new clip in his gun, he'd always load the first round by hand, whether there was a round left in the chamber or not. It's a technique they teach in the Middle East. By making sure there's always a round in the chamber, you eliminate the risk of pulling the trigger with nothing to fire. He must have heard about it from someone or read it somewhere. In any case, he probably wanted to try it out for himself. And he was obviously motivated by vanity to show off his new technique. That's when you make mistakes. The battlefield is an unforgiving place. The only techniques you can rely on are the ones you've mastered through experience and practice. Uh-huh. And what were you saying about him being more suited to revolvers? When he fired, he was bending his elbow sharply to avoid the recoil. It looked like he wasn't aware he was doing it, but that habit can be either a fatal flaw or a gift. What do you mean? Automatic weapons use recoil to operate, so if you don't let the recoil hit you, it interferes with the operating cycle of the gun. Basically, he shouldn't be trying to avoid the impact like that. But with a revolver, there's no need to let the recoil hit you. Just the opposite. 
Avoiding the recoil lets you reduce the strain on your hand and arm. That kid might just be handy with a high-caliber revolver. Handy? Are you listening to yourself? What do you mean? He's the enemy. Why are you giving him advice? Uh, I... Snake. I don't know. For some reason, I couldn't help but point it out to him. Snake, are you all right? Yeah. Thanks to last week's nuclear incident, the Soviet Union is now on secondary alert. We're one step away from a nuclear war. DEFCON 2, huh? In American parlance, yes. From what Western intelligence has been able to gather, the radical elements in the Soviet command are showing signs of impatience. They say we're on the brink of World War III here. And with Khrushchev's position getting weaker every day, I worry whether he'll be able to hold them back. One week. Yes. America must eliminate the boss by its own hand to prove its innocence. There is no other way to resolve the crisis. Everything rests on your shoulders, Snake. Failure is not an option. I know. Major, what should I do with this wreck of a drone? Just leave it there. Are you sure? Yes. But isn't this thing top secret? Yes, it is. After the U-2 spy plane incident four years ago, plans were laid out for future spy missions in Soviet airspace to be carried out by an unmanned craft. That craft was the D-21 spy drone, the basis of the one you came in on. The D-21 is launched from a craft called the M-21. The M-21 itself is a derivative of the A-12, a supersonic long-range spy plane currently being developed as the successor to the U-2. However, for this mission, we used a modified YF-12A, a long-range interceptor version of the A-12. After being released from the mothership, the drone can achieve speeds upwards of Mark III at high altitude using its ramjet engine. It can't be shot down by ground-to-air missiles, and it's nearly undetectable by radar. With Selenoyarsk in such a high state of alert after our last escapade, this was the only reliable way to get you in. This is all top-secret military technology. Are you telling me I'm supposed to just leave it here? That's right. Why? The purpose of Operation Snake Eater is to send an American agent into the field in order to eliminate a defector and traitor, namely the boss. Part of that mission involves making sure the Soviets find out what we're doing. So we have to leave behind some kind of evidence that the U.S. was involved. Don't worry. The technologically sensitive components of the craft were rigged to self-destruct when it landed. The only thing the Soviets are going to find is a pile of American-made scrap metal. Got it. Just one thing, though. What is it? I think they'd better redesign the landing impact buffer. People are going to get hurt landing that thing. I'll let them know. Major, I appreciate you allowing me to use weapons, but shouldn't I be carrying some rubles? You mean fake currency? Right. Snake, do you remember the Francis Gary Powers incident back in 1960? Powers was flying a U-2 on a spy mission for the CIA in Soviet airspace. He was shot down and taken prisoner. His confession brought to light the fact that the CIA was spying in Soviet airspace. As a result, the U.S.-Soviet summit scheduled for two weeks later was cancelled. Yeah, I remember. U-2 pilots are required to carry items that mask their identity. Powers was carrying ruble, mark and lira coins, as well as French gold coins. He was also carrying two gold watches and seven women's rings. All of these objects were meant to conceal his national origins. But for this mission, we've got to demonstrate to the Khrushchev regime that America is involved. There's no need to conceal your origins. And besides, all you need to do is complete your mission. As long as you're not captured or killed, the details will take care of themselves. Okay. The Soviet intelligence community must be up in arms about the boss's defection. The great Voyevoda has abandoned America and embraced the Soviet Union. Voyevoda? Apparently, that's what they call the boss behind the Iron Curtain. It means warrior or mighty soldier in Russian. When used to refer to a woman, it means something close to Lady Knight. In Russia, where they've had a number of female emperors throughout their history, it's a term of great respect, well, poetic in a way. The boss's exploits have made her name famous in the East as well. Major, 
Why did the boss defect? I don't know, but I will tell you this. America is all too eager to get rid of her. What do you mean? She knows too many of our secrets. If she were to relay all the top secret information she knows to the Soviet bloc, it would put us at a severe disadvantage. It might even lead to the downfall of the West. Even if we survive, the boss is still too much of a hero to us. With her in the Soviet camp, we'd suffer a fatal loss of morale at home. There are even whispers that some of the less stalwart elements of the military might follow her example and defect themselves. I assume you're aware that since your last mission, several key figures within the CIA have been placed under house arrest. Yeah. The loss of the boss has been a painful one indeed. What about you? <laughs> Me? I still can't believe it. As a comrade, I would have placed my trust in her before my own family. But now that I think about it, the boss always seemed to have an aura of mystery about her. I never would have expected it to manifest in this way, though. Oh. Oh, well, it won't do to get all misty-eyed about it. She's an enemy now, worthy of nothing more than our contempt. Understood. Major. Yes? I was just wondering, why do they call you Zero? What do you mean? We go back a long ways, but I just realized I never asked you why you're called Zero. You want to know where it comes from? Yeah, if that's all right. Well, it's a bit nostalgic, really. Nostalgic? Hmm, the first British intelligence outfit was established in 1909. The head of the Foreign Intelligence Division was a man named Mansfield George Smith Cumming. He was referred to simply as C after the first letter of his last name. Since then, out of respect for Cumming, the heads of the SIS have traditionally taken the name of C. And James Bond's boss is called M. That's right. I myself was once known as O. And that's where Zero comes from? Precisely. In another sense, though, it signifies a ghost, one whose true identity must remain a mystery, the primogenitor of the solo sneaking operation. Is that so? Paramedic. Snake, it's so good to hear from you again. Same here. It's been a week, hasn't it? Four days, actually. Huh? I visited you in the hospital. You were still unconscious, though. Ah, then you must have seen me naked. Yeah, but you were all wrapped up in bandages and tubes, so I couldn't do anything but look. Better luck next time. Mm, let's hope so. But seriously, don't forget that you were like that until just yesterday. In fact, you really shouldn't even be on this mission. Keep an eye on your stamina gauge. If you start to run low, don't push yourself. Eat something to replenish your stamina. And try not to get yourself hurt. If you're wounded or get bitten by a venomous animal, go into the survival viewer immediately and treat yourself using cure. Yeah, yeah. I can see you still know how to nag. You're welcome. And I can see you still don't know when to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Maybe so. By the way, I heard you're going to lose your medical license if this mission fails. Yes, there was talk of that, but the mission won't fail, will it? Of course not. Good. I believe in you. But you know what? I really don't care about my medical license. Didn't they use that to force you to participate in this operation? No, I volunteered. Why? So that I could watch over you. Huh. Snake, you're the best agent I've ever seen. But you push yourself too hard. You're reckless. Someone has to stop you from getting into trouble to make sure you and the boss don't kill each other. So that's why I volunteered. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better guardian angel than me, right? Thanks. Stop right there. Huh? You can thank me when you get back. All right. Okay, good luck, Snake. Thanks. Sounds like the Cobra Unit's members' names came from the specific emotions they each carry into battle. Emotions? Yeah. For unbearable torment, the pain. For true oblivion, the end. For infinite rage, the fury. For absolute terror, the fear. And for unsurpassed bliss, the joy. The joy? It's another name for the boss, because of the joy she feels in battle, I suppose. Ah. During the war, she had a partner named the Sorrow. Sorrow and Joy. They say there couldn't have been a more perfect pair. 
The Davy Crockett's that the boss took with her when she defected are mortars that fire nuclear warheads. They're named after Davy Crockett, the hero who died defending the Alamo in the Texan War of Independence. Remember the Alamo. That's right. The warheads are equivalent to between 10 and 20 tons of TNT. Every building within 150 yards of the hypocenter is completely obliterated. But the warheads the boss had with her were some kind of experimental super bomb. So they're actually even more powerful than that. I don't even want to think about what would happen if she used it again. Snake, you know what you have to do. Yeah. I know. I heard you fought against KGB troops in the Virtuous Mission. But this time you're up against Spetsnaz. Spetsnaz is the Special Forces Unit of GRU, the intelligence wing of the Soviet Defense Ministry's General Staff Office. Spetsnaz troops undergo rigorous training in all types of special ops, from assassination and demolition to intelligence gathering. That and Volgan's loaded, man. His unit is one of the best equipped in the entire Soviet Union, if not the best. I heard the enemies you encountered in the Virtuous Mission were only carrying weapons like AKs and grenades. Well, it ain't that simple anymore. In addition to AKs, some of the patrols you'll encounter might be equipped with Scorpion submachine guns and shotguns. The Scorpion is even lighter than the AK, making it much easier to handle. Basically, a guy with a Scorpion is not gonna miss you as often as with an AK. The shotgun is a powerful weapon. One blast is enough to floor you and you're likely to be seriously wounded. Watch for that, man. Major. What is it? Why did the boss betray us? Leave it alone, Snake. But... We've been through this before. Besides, asking for reasons now won't change anything. I thought I'd find out if I met her face to face. I thought for sure she'd tell me, but... Then you'll have to find your own answers. By completing my mission? Yes. <sighs> Snake, whatever happens to you, make sure you leave a descendant, okay? Are you saying you want to have my baby? No. I'm saying that in the 21st century, the genes of soldiers like you are going to be in high demand. Genes? Uh-huh. Remember when Watson and Crick discovered the double helix structure of DNA back in 1953? Ah. Uh, no. You know, they won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for it the year before last. Of course, you have to feel sorry for Pauling and Franklin. They were researching the exact same thing. Sorry, I don't follow. Inside every living creature are little blueprints called genes. Through the union of the sperm and egg cells, these blueprints are transformed and inherited by the next generation. That's why parents and children resemble each other. The concept of genes was first proposed over a hundred years ago by Mendel, but he didn't know what they were exactly. For a while, it was thought that chromosomes were composed not of deoxyribonucleic acid, but of proteins called polypeptides. Later, it was shown that deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, was a biological macromolecule. Then 11 years ago, Watson and Crick discovered that DNA had a double helix structure. Yeah, this is all fascinating stuff, but what exactly does it have to do with me? The inherent characteristics of any given individual are determined by his or her genes. By duplicating a set of superior genes, a separate body with the same set of characteristics, a clone can be created. But genes don't control a person's fate. That's true. But having an offspring that's genetically identical to the parent is more efficient, right? You can expect better results that way. More efficient? You can't mass produce human beings. Maybe. But now that we know the true nature of genes, human cloning is that much closer to reality. Nuclear transplanting is already theoretically possible. So one day... My genes are going to be a valuable commodity. Exactly. They'd never let that happen. Just think, even if your body dies, you survive and go on to bigger and better accomplishments. If you think about it, it's kind of an honor. Does that kind of technology seriously appeal to you? Well, I am a doctor. Hmm. I can't condone it on moral grounds, but I'm fascinated by the possibilities. Especially when I see such an excellent specimen as yourself. Yeah, well, thanks for the compliment, but it doesn't make me feel any better. Don't be so glum. It's not like it's going to happen anytime soon. We'll just have to wait and see. 
Tell me something, Sigint. What's that? What does Sigint mean, anyway? It's short for Signal Intelligence. Signal Intelligence? The part of intelligence that deals with electronic information. Things like intercepting and analyzing electronic communications, determining enemy force strength and positioning from radar emissions and radio chatter. You get the idea. Code breaking is considered part of SIGINT as well. Forty years from now, we'll be in the age of electronic warfare. It won't be long before information replaces firepower as the most valuable commodity on the battlefield. So you're saying they won't need guys like me anymore? Sorry to break it to you, but that's not gonna happen. No matter how advanced our technology gets, there's still no substitute for human beings. Hmm. Anyway, the Major is a man of foresight. He knew the electronic age was coming, and so he called out to me. And you responded? Well, I didn't have any place else to go. You couldn't find a job? Nope. None of the places where they do this kind of high-tech research would even let me in the door. Why not? I know you've got social problems, but... Come again? Nothing. I mean, someone with your talent ought to be able to... Yeah, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm black. Huh. The Major, though, he doesn't care about what color you are. I've never met anyone like him before. He's... different, you know? Oh, yeah, I know. I don't think racism's gonna go away even in the 21st century. But I want to work with computers and use them to bring people closer together. In the digital world, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, American or Russian or whatever. Everybody's going to be the same. That's what I think. Eva was right when she said that operating in an unknown jungle at night is extremely dangerous. In my former outfit, the SAS, we'd always be sure to set up camp before sunset and wait until daybreak before setting out again. Being able to stay in that abandoned factory made things a lot easier for you. You ought to be thanking, Eva. Major, what's this temptation Eva was talking about? In the Old Testament of the Bible, Eve was seduced by a snake into tasting the fruit of knowledge. By eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and were cast out from the Garden of Eden. Thus, it was the snake who led mankind into original sin. Come to think of it, I did break a rib in the virtuous mission. Maybe that's where Eva came from. But the one who tempted Adam into eating the forbidden fruit was Eve. You may be working together, but she's still a KGB operative. Don't let your guard down. I don't intend to. Snake, I heard you got a scientist disguise from Eva. Yeah. Go to uniform on the camouflage screen and choose scientist to disguise yourself as a scientist. Scientist, huh? But it won't do you any good to go around the jungle wearing a scientist disguise. No one would be that stupid. You're right. No one would think of going around the jungle in a scientist disguise. If they did, they'd have to be a fool. <laughs> oh, more than a fool. A complete dumbass. Don't you think so, Snake? Yeah. Snake? What's wrong, Major? I should be asking you the same question. Why are you wearing that outfit? I wanted to try it on. Did you listen to a word that I said? What are you thinking, dressing like a scientist in the middle of the jungle? Look at your camo index. You're a walking bullseye. Get back into your camouflage now. Ah, lighten up. What was that? Nothing. Snake, I looked at your medical record. You've been exposed to an atomic blast? Yeah, the Bravo shot. It was a hydrogen bomb test conducted at Bikini Atoll on March 1st, 1954. I was at the American base on Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands when the ashes of death started falling from the sky. Any symptoms? None. At least, not yet. But a lot of the guys who were in it with me are now suffering from thyroid cancer and leukemia. Some of them are dead already. One of these days. Anyway, I'd better get back to the mission. Yeah. Hey, Snake, remember back at the abandoned factory when you whittled the grip of that 45 down? Yeah. I've never heard of a customization like that before. Why the grip? To fit it with a knife. A knife? You're gonna keep the knife and the gun both at the ready? That's the idea. Why would you want to do that? Sometimes a knife works better in close proximity encounters. So I equip both at the same time. That way I can switch back and forth in an instant. Badass. So that's that. 
CQC. Snake, you said Eva said her Mauser was a Type 17, right? Yeah, what about it? That model was produced in the 1920s in a weapons lab in the Shangxi province in China. The cartridge part sticks out lower than the original to accommodate 45 caliber rounds. The barrel and chamber are a little bit thicker, too. But most telling of all, it's got Chinese characters engraved on both sides of the frame like you saw. And that firing stance Eva was talking about where you hold the gun horizontally? That's a trademark of the Chinese. Just like you were saying, when you're firing in full auto mode, the muzzle jump effect gives you a horizontal strafing motion. They say it's especially deadly in indoor and close-range mop-up actions. The Japanese called it bandit shooting and used to dread it. Makes you wonder where she learned to shoot like that. You know that army motorcycle that Eva was riding? That's a replica of a German model. A replica? Yeah. After World War II, the Soviets confiscated an entire assembly line from a German motorcycle factory. Machines and all. And then they took it back with them and started producing replicas? Exactly. Originally, that motorcycle was designed to be used with a sidecar attached. That means it's got enough power to drag a 200-plus pound sidecar around. So that's how she could pull off all those crazy stunts. Uh-huh. Of course, it takes a lot of skill to be able to control that much power. That Eva chick is something else. Eva, what kind of unit are those ocelots I fought a little while ago? The ocelot unit is an elite group composed of soldiers handpicked from among the ranks of Spetsnaz, the special forces wing of Gru. They've undergone even more rigorous training than regular Spetsnaz. Their skill with weapons is the stuff of legends. You'll find they're much better shots than the rest of Gru. Watch yourself. Eva, where are you now? I told you, didn't I? I'm right near the Colonel. Pretty weak answer, if you ask me. I suppose you're right. Eva. Snake, I'm under orders to cooperate with you, but that doesn't mean I have to tell you everything I know. I would assume the same applies to you, too. Mm. Tell me something, Snake. Why did you let Ocelot get away? I thought I told you already. Because he's still a kid? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty lame excuse, if you ask me. You think so? Yeah, I do. Maybe you're right. Snake, have you heard about the massacre that happened in the forest near the village of Gnezdovo? The Katyn Forest Massacre, right? During World War II, the German army came upon the bodies of 4,000 dead Polish in the forest of Katyn. Yeah, Germany blamed the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union denied it, blaming Germany in return. The truth is that Stalin ordered the NKVD to carry out the killings. And it's not just Katyn. In places like Western Ukraine and Belarus, there must have been at least 20,000 Poles in the prison camps. Why are you telling me this? Volgin was one of the people responsible. He was one of the vicious leaders behind it. Volgin was? He blamed it on a prisoner revolt to allay any fears and requested they be put to death. I've heard that Volgan even removed the blindfolds from each prisoner before he beat them to death. I knew he wasn't all there in the head, but this... Not someone you could be friends with. By the way, Snake, do you have a calorie mate? Yeah. Is it any good? I haven't tried it yet. Oh. You want it? What? Do you want the calorie mate? What? What are you saying? You want it, don't you? Well, I didn't say that. So you don't want it, then? No. But if you were going to give it to me as a token of thanks for me helping you out, then of course I wouldn't refuse it. Are you on a diet? What did you say? Calorie made is supposed to be really good for losing weight. <laughs> Are you saying I'm fat? No. I'm not on a diet, and I don't need one. I, I just wanted to try the taste. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Be careful with what you say. Yeah, sorry. So, is it true? Is what true? <sighs> that it's good for losing weight. Yeah. Calorie Mate provides a nutritionally balanced source of energy, and it makes counting calories easy. That's what's supposed to make it good for dieting. Oh. I see. 
I heard that all of the geisha in Japan use it. Geisha? Yeah. I've never heard about that. Really? Yes. I'm sure there are some geisha out there using calorie mate for diets, but I doubt all of them are using it. No, I guess not. Eva, that was some pretty nice driving. <laughs> really? Ballsy, yet overwhelmingly accurate. That kind of driving isn't something you can pick up in a couple of days. I told you to trust me. I love motorcycles. It is not easy to jackknife a bike like that. So, you believe me now? I think I'll pass on going tandem, though. Oh, that's too bad. Eva, about the 45 and the Mark 22 you showed me. Yeah? You said you got them from a vault full of Western weapons, right? That I did. How? A vault full of secret Western technology should be under strict surveillance. You really want to know? Yeah. Really? Yes. Well, I'm not telling anyway. Why not? It'd be a waste of time. A waste of time? Even if I explained how I did it, you'd never be able to do it yourself. What does that mean? Exactly what it sounds like. Snake? Eva, what do you think? <laughs> what a dork. You must be kidding me. Are you willing to risk your life for that joke? All right, finally I get a normal response. What? Everyone was giving me strange responses and acting like nothing was odd about it. I was starting to wonder myself, but now I feel better. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but you look adorable in it. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> this is too much. No, I don't. By the way, Snake. What? You know the Ocelot unit commander? Ocelot? Yeah, that's not his real name, is it? I wouldn't think so. Is it a code name? You mean like Snake? Yeah. Maybe. Why? Is that strange? No, I was just wondering why he's called Ocelot. Why is that? Well, I looked it up, and it turns out the Ocelot is a wild cat whose habitat stretches from the southern U.S. down to northern Argentina. They live in a variety of different environments from tropical rainforests to savannas. The biggest ones can grow up to one meter in length. They're normally solitary creatures, and their diet consists mainly of small animals and fish. During the day, they sleep up in the trees, but at night... Yeah, uh, paramedic. Oh, right. So, the ocelot is an animal that lives on the American continent. But then I wondered, why would a Soviet officer be using the name of an American wildcat? Good question. Maybe it's because he's fast and agile like an ocelot. Hmm. Yeah, maybe you're right. Hmm. But why'd you go to all the trouble of looking it up? Because I was curious. Was it helpful? Uh, sure. Eva. Hmm? You said you got along with the boss, right? Yeah, we get along pretty well. I admire her. Although she's supposed to be the distant hero, for some reason she's nice to me. She even carried my bags for me the other day. <laughs> I was impressed. Your bags? Maybe because we're both defectors. We never talk much but I get the feeling that she understands how I feel. I've had dreams about the whole thing. You say there are attack dogs? Those attack dogs are Great Danes. The breed is originally from Germany. They've been used for hundreds of years as hunting dogs. As you can see, they're very large, strong too. They've got a calm yet courageous temperament, and on top of that, they're extremely intelligent. In some cases, a trained Great Dane can be more dangerous than a human opponent. Watch out for them. Interesting. Forget it, Snake. Forget what? You were thinking about how they taste, weren't you? I wasn't thinking. Don't lie to me. I could tell by the look on your face. You can't see my face. No, but I can imagine it. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare think about trying to capture an attack dog. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. Snake, be careful of those attack dogs. Don't worry. I know how dangerous they are. 
No, you're the one who's dangerous. Me? Those dogs are just innocent animals, even if they've been trained to kill. You shouldn't hurt them unless you have to. But... You know, humans and dogs have been living together for 50,000 years ever since the Stone Age. Sure, they make good pets and watchdogs, but they also help us out in a variety of different fields. Not just as police and army dogs, but as hunters, shepherds, rescuers, and seeing eye dogs. They deserve our respect. I know what you mean. I'm a dog sled fan myself. In the future, many of the jobs that dogs do now will probably be taken over by machines. They'll have miniature unmanned reconnaissance vehicle and security systems. And in the 21st century, I'll bet they'll even be selling robot dogs as pets. You've got to be kidding. But even if that happens, dogs will still be our most trusted companions. Unmanned recon vehicle? That's a pretty scary thought. Well, for now, trained dogs are the best they've got. Snake, the enemy's attack dogs are very highly trained, so be careful. You can tell if a dog's been highly trained or not? I can tell. Oh. I used to have a dog. You had a dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's so funny about it? Nothing. It's just hard to picture you with a puppy. Who asked you? He was really cute, but I had a hard time housebreaking him. When he finally did learn, I was so happy. I still dream about it sometimes. Eva, I wanted to ask you about Ocelot. Yeah, I know. He's pretty infatuated with you, isn't he? That's not what I meant. Aren't the Ocelots an elite unit? Yeah. So how'd he get to be their commander? He can't be any older than 18 or 19. I can't believe he's already a major. I heard from the Colonel that he's been given special treatment. Special treatment? Yeah, he's the son of some legendary hero or something. No wonder he seems to have the right stuff. So who is this legendary hero, anyway? Beats me. <sighs> the Colonel never told me. All I heard was that his mother was supposedly shot in the gut during battle, and that he was born right there with bullets whizzing past them. A pregnant woman in the middle of a battle? That's what I heard. They say that when they stitched her up, the scar was shaped like a snake. Well, that's battlefield medicine for you. What about his father, this legendary hero? He didn't tell me. I don't think Ocelot's ever met his parents. Are they dead? Maybe. I don't know. There were a lot of MIAs back then, during the last days of the war. Ocelot probably would have ended up the same way. But he was taken in and raised by Gru and Volgan. Because he was special. That's my guess. Major, why did the pain explode like that? It's part of their legend. Legend? The legend of the Cobra unit. I'll let Sigint explain. Sigint? Yeah, that. That's a microbomb. A microbomb? Yep. During World War II, the Cobra unit was used for the nastiest kinds of wet works, the kind that could never be let out into the open. Their missions were so top secret that not only were they forbidden to be taken prisoner, they couldn't even leave their corpse behind. Because of this, or so the legend goes, they carried a microbomb with them on their missions in case they needed to commit suicide. I always thought it was just a rumor. I never expected it would turn out to be true. But why would they be carrying bombs this time around? It's not like they're in hostile territory. Maybe they're ready to die. Ready to die? Yeah. They've got no unit to go back to. Not even a country. So they've got no place to die except the battlefield, huh? Yeah. No turning back for them. I wonder if the boss feels the same. Major. Eva isn't responding to the radio. Right. Right. Snake, she's been talking to you from inside an enemy facility. She's not always going to be able to answer the radio. Don't assume something's wrong just because you're not getting a response. Don't worry about Eva. Stay focused on your mission. Got it. Major, do you know anything about this, Tanya? No. Nothing? Not a thing. Why not? He must have checked up on Sokolov when he defected two years ago. If he had a lover... Make no mistake, we conducted a thorough investigation, but there was nothing about him having a mistress. Maybe you didn't notice. That's impossible. Then he must have become involved with her after he was taken back to Russia. I wonder... What is it, Major? Something wrong? I don't think Sokolov would take a lover. Why not? 
I still remember him two years ago. After we got him across the border, the first words he spoke from his hospital bed after he regained consciousness were, are my wife and daughter safe? And right up until the time he was taken back to Russia, he kept begging me over and over to take care of his family, almost as if he was delirious. Sokolov is a man who loves his family. Betraying his wife is something he'd... Major. What is it? People change. Hmm. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Maybe. Snake? Did you kill another one of the Cobras? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was the end. Good work. Now you won't have to deal with him later. I guess so. What's wrong? It's nothing. Surely you're not going to tell me you wanted to test your skills against a legendary sniper that even the boss respected? No. Snake, this isn't a contest or sport. This is war. The only thing you should be thinking about is carrying out your mission. Yeah, I know. Sigint, Granin said something about putting legs on a tank. Do you know what he was talking about? If you ask me, it's gotta be a joke. Not only is making a tank walk on two legs a technical nightmare, but there's no point in making a walking tank to begin with. Putting legs on a tank would raise its clearance, increasing its frontal projection area. It'd also be less stable. Suppose the legs help the tank travel on bad roads. I, I don't see the logic in that. Isn't that what treads are for? I mean, anybody who'd seriously consider making a thing like that has got to be a wacko. Come to think of it, there was a guy in the States who wrote a paper on that subject. What was his name? Emerson? Heinrich? Something like that. I don't really remember. Of course, no one took that seriously. Sigint, Grannon was saying that Sokolov's research project was a tank fitted with rockets. Uh-huh. Do you have any idea what he meant? Sorry, beats me. I wonder if it's supposed to increase the tank's mobility, or maybe give the tank short-range missile launching capability. But you're sure it has something to do with Phase 2 of the Shagohod, right? Yeah. Khrushchev traded Cuba just to get this thing finished, and Volgin blew up a Soviet research facility to get his hands on it. Whatever it is, it's gotta be big. Sigint. Do you know anything about that philosopher's legacy Grandin was talking about? Not a clue. Never even heard of something like that until now. Right. One thing's for sure, though. Vogan's got a huge amount of money stashed away somewhere. Philosopher's legacy, huh? Maybe it is real. That Order of Lenin that Grandin was talking about is the most prestigious award in the Soviet Union. It's given to individuals, organizations, and cities for outstanding achievements in warfare, science, industry, the arts, and various other fields. You could say it's the highest honor the East has to give. You say Granin was involved in the development of the SS-1C. The SS-1C is the Soviet's newest short-range tactical ballistic missile. Based on what Western intel has been able to gather, it's capable of being launched from a mobile platform. A mobile platform? Yeah. It's a transport vehicle that functions as an erector and a launcher. It can travel on roads, then erect and launch a missile from any location. Of course, in addition to conventional explosives, the missiles could also be fitted with chemical or even nuclear warheads. A nuclear missile that can be launched from any location? I'll bet it wasn't the missile itself that Granin helped develop. More likely, it was the mobile platform. From what I've heard, the SS-1C is set for actual deployment as early as next year. That's bound to send a chill down NATO's spine. Eva. What? I couldn't get a hold of you for a while there. What were you doing? What do you think I was doing? That's what I'm asking you. Why are you asking me that? Because I want to know, that's why. Want to know what? Will you stop answering my questions with questions? Are you mad? <sighs> See ya. Eva. Yes? Who is that Tatiana? <laughs> Taking a liking to her, have we? Mm. Yeah, she's a cutie. Who is she? I don't know that much about her, but from what I can tell, she seems to be Sokolov's lover. Can you find out a little more? Snake. She already has a man. Eva. All right, just give me a minute. Snake, there's supposed to be a Suchinoko in that area. 
Tsuchinoko. You've never heard of it? It's a mysterious snake that's found all over Japan. If it lives all over Japan, then why is it so mysterious? Many people have seen them, but no one's ever caught one. If you do manage to catch one, it'll be a major historic discovery. I think you should look for it. If I have time. So what kind of snake is this, Tsujinoko? The body is about as thick as a beer bottle, and the tail tapers off to a point. It doesn't slither around like other snakes, but rather goes in a straight line like an inchworm. Sometimes it even jumps several yards at a time. It's got sinister-looking eyes, and it can even blink and move its eyes around. It's also been known to snore, cry, and stand up straight on its tail. And this is an actual snake? Of course. Uh-huh. Then how come you seem to know so much about them? Is it in that guide of yours? No. Then maybe you saw it in a movie, like Curse of the 50-Foot Tsuchinoko or something. There's no such movie. I heard about it from Sigint. Sigint? He's an expert on UMAs. UMAs? Unidentified mysterious animals, dummy. Oh, excuse my ignorance. Why does he know so much about them? Probably because he likes them. At the CIA, he was the vice president of an unofficial group called the UMA Watcher Club. The UMA Watcher Club? Yeah, just the other day he was working on the newsletter at his desk. At the office? How does he get away with that? Well, the major is the chairman of the club. Uh-huh. Snake, I found out what I could about your Tanya. Just as I thought, she's apparently Sokolov's lover. When Sokolov was taken away from his research facility, she was taken along with him. So she's been with him since he was at the research facility? Mm, that's what it looks like. Are you sure about that? Yes. Why? The Major said Sokolov wasn't the kind of guy who'd take a lover. Mm, maybe he was lonely, being away from his family for so long. And whatever else he is, Sokolov's still a man. It's only natural he'd be attracted to her. Only natural? She's irresistible. Gorgeous in a girl-next-door kind of way. Nice proportions, too. Hmm. Sounds like your type, huh? Eva. Gotta go. Eva, how are things on your end? Are you going to be able to make it? I'm fine. I managed to slip out okay, though I did run into a few snags. Is there a problem? I took a little detour on my way here. Detour? Yeah, I thought since you went to all this trouble to meet me, I should give you a present. A present? What is it? You really want to know? Yeah. It's a secret. <sighs> You'll find out when you get here. Major, I saw that Tatiana woman again. Hmm. We've been analyzing our data, but so far we've been unable to find anyone matching that description. Maybe her posting was so obscure that we simply overlooked it. Or maybe she's such a VIP that all the data on her has been classified. That's a possibility, but I'd be tempted to go with the first explanation. We'll keep going over the data. Thanks. The horse the boss was riding sounds like an Andalusian. Andalusians are from the region of Andalusia in Spain. They're renowned for their beauty, their gentle nature, and their physical prowess. Hmm. Just so you know, you can't eat them. Hey, I didn't say anything. Yeah, but you were going to. I was? Yes. Don't even think about eating a horse, got it? Guess I'll have to mark it off the list. What did you say? I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. You say Granin's shoes were rigged with a transmitter? That sounds like something the KGB's been working on lately. It's exactly like you described, a miniature transmitter that's small enough to put in a shoe. Granin said he got the shoes from a woman called Tatiana. You think she's a KGB spy? Could be. Or maybe it's some kind of ploy to throw suspicion on her. Anyway, it's your job to find out. Good point. Sigint. Yo! Eva said she set up a ground effect vehicle for us to make our escape. So I heard. The ground effect vehicle, or WIG, is something like a cross between an airplane and a boat. It uses ground effect to fly. 
Ground effect basically means that when the craft skims the surface of the ground, the air between the ground and the wing is compressed, which gives the wing an extra boost. From what Western intelligence agencies have been able to gather, the Russians are pretty serious about developing these wigs. Apparently, they're planning on using them for anti-submarine patrols. I guess I can see why. The WIG's long cruising range and high-speed capabilities make it a good choice for that kind of mission. Eva must have gotten her hands on one of the first prototypes while it was being field-tested as a transport craft. The WIG has a top speed of over 400 miles per hour, and its range is pretty good too. Not that speed is going to help you if you've got a supersonic fighter jet on your tail, but if you hug the surface and stay off the radar, you should have no problems getting away. What a strange coincidence, though. Coincidence? Well, Rykov's full name is Ivan Rydenovich Rykov. And? Ivan is the Russian equivalent of John, and a common nickname for John is Jack. Ah. You know, in Russian folklore, the youngest son in a family often receives the shabbiest treatment, but is actually cleverer than his brothers, and has the happiest ending of all. That son is usually named Ivan. I don't have any brothers. Really? I could have sworn you had several. What? Eva, about this Major Rykov. Yes? You said he had Colonel Class authorization, right? Right. But his rank is Major, so how can he have Colonel Class authorization? Rykov is treated as an officer of equal rank with Colonel Volgin. Treated as the same rank? Yeah. Even though he's a Major? Right. Why? You don't know? No. Even after seeing that photo? Nope. Has anyone ever told you you're a bit slow? What are you talking about? I'll leave you to think about it. Wait a minute. Gotta go. Eva, about the escape plan. Yeah, we're getting out on a wig. The ground effect vehicle. Right. Here they call it an Akrano plan. The Soviet Union has already finished testing one of those? No, this is just the prototype given to Gru. It was designed to search out and destroy American submarines. That's why it has a long range and a decent speed of 470 miles per hour. It's far beyond the BE-1 developed three years ago. The problem for us is that the one here doesn't have any weapons on board. If we're tailed, our only choice is to try and shake them. I'll leave that to you. Sorry if I won't have the time to play stewardess for you. By the way, Snake. What? Why aren't you eating it? Huh? What are you talking about? The instant noodles. Why aren't you eating them? Do I have to? Of course you do. Why? <laughs> because it's a present for me. Um... You probably didn't know, but instant noodles are really popular among the troops here at Groznygrad. It was really hard to get my hands on some. And I even managed to get three whole packages of it. Three? But you only gave me two. Uh... Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, you'd better eat it, or else. You ate some food? Yes. You aren't expecting food to recover life, are you? Of course not. Food alone doesn't heal wounds. Food only recovers stamina. Good. Why do you ask? I once had a guy who thought that eating canned food would recover his life. Well, was he some kind of idiot? Of sorts, yes. But in the 21st century, they'll probably come up with something that does just that. Eva, what kind of guy is Rykov? He's Volgan's precious pet. Anything else? He's got a handsome face. Is that what you really think? No, I'm just being objective. I'm not interested in people who aren't interested in me. I was hoping to get some useful info for becoming him. Hmm, he seems mild-mannered, but the kind of guy who would sit in his room and admire his bug collection. That still doesn't help me much. Anything more? I really don't know, Snake. Uh, can't you just observe him and copy him yourself? Why are you so evasive about this? <sighs> People like me don't even exist in his little world. I see. Okay, then. Did he dump you? I see, huh? You don't get it at all. No, not that. I'm just not good with his type. But... 
If this conversation goes on any longer, I'm going to send my fist through this radio into your head. Figure him out yourself. Later. <laughs> Snake, have you found Rykov? Yeah, but he got away. What? Sorry, Major. I'll get... Stop your blathering and go take him out already. Okay, but... What are you waiting for? Get going. Major, why are you so pissed off all of a sudden? You have something against this guy? No, no, it's just every time I think of that face, it makes me furious. Doesn't it make you? Um... Just get moving. Knock him out and steal his clothes. Snake, I wanted to ask you something. What? In the torture room? Why did you protect me when Ocelot was about to fire? Because I knew that the chamber wasn't empty, and you'd be dead if he pulled the trigger. But your eye... I was tied up, and it happened so fast. It was the best I could do. I feel a little strange, but it won't interfere with the mission. What about me? Huh? Did you only save me because I was important for completing your mission? What other reason would there be? And when the mission is over? Right now, it's just the mission. The mission you used to love? That's not what I mean. Major, I dug out the bullet the boss shot into me. Yes? There was a fake death pill inside. A fake death pill? Yeah. What does it mean? I haven't a clue. But if it's the work of the boss, then it probably means something. Snake, you say you've discovered a transmitter? Yeah, it was buried in a wound. I think Ocelot did it. He must be expecting me to get out of here. Then you mustn't disappoint him. All right. Eva, what happened to Ocelot? <laughs> Can't get enough of him, huh? He doesn't trust you. I know. So it's me you're worried about then. Eva! I'm fine. I know how to handle him. Besides, I think he's got his mind set on someone else right about now. What? Figure it out. Paramedic. Hmm? How do I make myself throw up? Huh? I need to throw up. What? what do you need to throw up? Anything's fine. I just need to vomit. What in the... Eva said I might be able to get the guard to open the door if I pretend to be sick. Oh. What did you think it was? Uh, nothing. Uh, hey, hey. Huh? I think letting the guard see you throw up is a good idea. You can eat something poisonous to give yourself food poisoning. That'll make you throw up after a while. Or you can use the survival viewer to make yourself dizzy. In the survival viewer, press the viewer button to enter viewer mode. Then use the right stick to spin your body around. Do that long enough and you'll start to get dizzy. When you're dizzy enough, you'll throw up the moment you exit the survival viewer. Try it out. Snake? Snake! What? Oh, Major, what do you want? What happened? You've been acting strangely ever since you were washed down the river. I'm fine. I disagree. R really? Yes. Did something happen to you in that river? No. Don't lie, Snake. I'm trying to help you. All right. But you might not believe me when I tell you. I'll believe it. I trust you. Okay, then. When I was in that river... Yes? I saw... the other side. The other side? Yeah. And by the other side, you mean... Well, the world of the dead, I guess. Oh. And the sorrow was there. He was sad. No, more than that. He said I was part of his sorrow. I see. Um, Snake, would you excuse me for a moment? Huh? Sure. Paramedic, what in the hell is wrong with Snake? Beats me. Maybe he got a nasty bump on the head. You really think that's all? What are you implying? Uh, Major. I mean, he's always been a little bit different. Well, I thought maybe... Good point. I was just thinking that myself. Major! Uh, what, what is it, Snake? I can hear you. But, uh, well, well, in any case, I'm, I'm glad you're all right. Uh, y yeah, me too. It's good to see you're back to, uh, uh normal. 
The Cynthia that Eva mentioned was a famous lady spy who worked for Britain during the Second World War. Her real name was Amy Elizabeth Thorpe. She was a lovely, intelligent woman, and she used those charms as a weapon to extract numerous secrets from the enemy. They say her most brilliant achievement was getting the French Vichy government's naval ciphers. But don't let yourself be taken in by Eva's charms. I'll be careful. I'll be your eyes. Makes me want to cry. Why is that? Reminds me of something a certain spy once said. His name was Oleg Penkovsky, a Western spy who worked inside Gru. He was arrested by the KGB and executed last year. They say he sent a letter to the DCI at the time saying, I must remain on this front line in order to be your eyes and ears. His code name was Hero. A hero whose name will never be known. Yes. That's the world we live in. Huh? Snake, take a look in your backpack. What the? My food's gone. Major, what the hell is going on here? Don't ask me, ask Eva. Eva? Eva, about the contents of the backpack you got for me. Is something wrong with it? The food is all gone. Oh. Did you eat it? Of course not. Why would I? Then who did? It was Ocelot. Ocelot? He said he wanted to eat the same things you did. Why would he do that? You haven't figured it out? No. You are dense. <sighs> Eva, didn't you take a picture of me when I was about to leave the waterfall cave? Oh, that. That's a button-shaped hidden camera developed by the KGB. I use it to take pictures of the fortress and the Shagahad. That's not what I wanted to know. Why did you take a picture of me? Because I wanted a picture of you. If I told you why, would you believe me anyway? <sighs> Eva, remember how you said today was a day of rest for the scientists in the hangar? Yeah. What did you mean by that? Until yesterday, there were tons of scientists and maintenance personnel working in the hangar. But because Volgan was forcing them to work day and night, a lot of the scientists were collapsing from exhaustion. So now that the prototype is finished and things are a little less hectic, they gave the scientists a day to rest. I see. If they were still working like that, it would have been impossible for you to sneak into the hangar. But this doesn't mean the hangar is completely deserted. I'm pretty sure there are still a few guards and maintenance personnel left. Stay alert. Eva, that Shagahad data you got from Sokolov. Uh-huh. Are you really going to give it to Khrushchev? You think I'm going to answer that? I know I want you to answer me. You're asking me for something I can't give you. Uh... Snake. I have a mission to carry out, just like you. Please, try to understand. That area is known as Chorny Prud. The name means something like the Black Shore in Russian. It got its name from the deep swamp that covers the area. The crocodiles in that swamp are extremely vicious. Apparently, they've already chewed up a bunch of soldiers out on patrol. Now, no one even dares to go near the swamp. They said that most of the soldiers who were killed were attacked from behind while they were in the water. You be careful out there. That area is known as Rasviet. It means dawn in Russian. The area got that name when the factory was first constructed. But the factory ended up being closed down, and Selino Yarsk was reborn as a secret research center and military fortress. The crevice that leads to the cave is to the north of your current location. Keep heading north. That area is called Dolino Vodno. The name means Forest of the Canyon. It probably got that name from the chasm that divides the jungle in two. The rope bridge at the center was hastily constructed to enable them to patrol Dromuchi. Speaking of which, what are you doing all the way back there? Get back to the north now. That forest is known as Dromuchi. It means the untouched forest in Russian. The name says it all. Dramuchi is a pristine jungle at the far edge of Selino Yarsk, untouched by human hands. 
The forest is so dense that large units can't penetrate it, making it a natural defense. That's why Sokolov's research facility and Groznygrad were built here. But more to the point, what are you doing all the way out there? You're not thinking of abandoning the mission, are you? Get back to the north. Good. You made it to Bolshaya Pust. The name Bolshaya Pust means something close to the Great Cavity. It probably got that name from the crevice to the north. There's a fortified area in the southern part of Bolshaya Pust that's strung with barbed wire. To the north of that is a relay station that serves as both a depot for material shipments and a communication facility. The crevice leading to the cave is located to the north of the relay station. Head north. That cave is known as Chornaya Peshara. In Russian, Chornaya Peshara means the black cave from which cold wind blows. It's a magma cavern formed millions of years ago, back when Salino Yarsk was the site of volcanic activity. The structure of the cave is pretty complex, but you should be able to find the aqueduct if you keep moving inward. Head toward the interior of the cave. The name of that forest is Sviato Gorni. In Russian, it means something like the sacred mountain path. The name comes from an old folk tale about mountain spirits who pass through there on their way to Sokrovieno, the forest to the north. That aqueduct is known as Ponizovie. It means the land down the river. As you can see, it's overgrown with mangrove. Usually, they'd have boats going up and down transporting materials. But right now, the place is on high alert, so the boats have stopped running. Speaking of which, what are you doing all the way back there? Get back to the north now. The area you're in now is known as Granini Gorky. It means Granin's Mountain. Apparently, it got that name when the Granin Lab was first built. But more to the point, what are you doing there? I, I told you we were supposed to meet up in the mountains, didn't I? Go back through the warehouse to Sviato Gorni. The forest you're in now is known as Sokro Vieno. The name means the most holy woods. It's been venerated since ancient times as the sacred home of the spirits of the forest. It's the largest and deepest forest in the region and is divided into three areas, south, west, and north. Try not to get lost, okay? There's an armory in the southern area. If you need some extra ammo, you might want to pay it a visit. You made it to the mountains. Those mountains are known as Krasnogorye. The name means the Red Mountain Ridge in Russian. The entire range has been fortified to act as a defense for the great fortress of Groznygrad. The area near the top has been dug with bunkers and trenches, and there are anti-aircraft gun emplacements everywhere. It's literally an impenetrable wall. Proceed with caution. Oh, there's a provision storehouse in the hillside area, and there's an armory at the summit. That area is known as Tiko Gorni. It means the tranquil mountain ridge in Russian. Like the name says, it's the most beautiful riverbank in the region of Groznygrad. Eva. What's up? About our escape plan. Uh-huh. How exactly are you planning to get to the lake? What? Don't you trust me? That's not what I meant. Okay then, I'll explain it to you. To the north of Groznygrad, there's a forest called Lazorevo. The name Lazorevo means the lush green earth. On the other side of Lazorevo is a large forest called Zauzyorye. Zauzyorye means near the lake in Russian. The lake is just beyond Zauzyorye. And the name of that lake is Rokovoy Biereg, the Lake of Destiny. That's where you hit the wig. Yeah, we'll use it to make our getaway. Once we've completed our missions, that is. Snake, that building next to you is an enemy armory. As you might have guessed, those armories you sometimes run into are where they keep their ammo and other stuff. If you take out an armory, the enemy units in the area will have their ammo supply cut off. And if they know they're on their last leg, they'll use ammo a little more sparingly in a gunfight. Bottom line, if you blow up an armory, the enemy's firepower decreases. By destroying an armory, you can cut off the enemy's supply of ammunition. That should make your job a lot easier. 
Snake, that building next to you is a provision storehouse. A provision storehouse is where the enemy keeps their food. Enemy units in that area use it to stock up on rations. So if you happen to blow up a provision storehouse, the enemies in that area won't be able to get any more rations. Spetsnaz are people too. They gotta eat, or their stamina starts to go down. They might pass out more easily or lose their concentration and start to shoot less accurately. Who knows? They'll probably be a little more desperate for food just lying around. Basically, if you get rid of a provision storehouse, the enemies in that area will get physically weaker. By destroying a provisions warehouse, you can cut off the food supply to enemies in the surrounding area. It may be worthwhile if you have time and materials to spare. They sick the tag dogs on you? People have been using dogs in war since before recorded history. The Greek and Roman armies used to send out packs of dogs with spiked collars to charge at enemy ranks. Attack dogs were regularly employed in the First and Second World Wars as well. Traditionally, dogs have been used to keep watch, send messages, and assist in search operations. Then the Soviets came up with a new idea, using them to carry bombs. Bomb dogs? Yeah. They were trained to dive beneath tanks carrying a payload of bombs. Apparently it worked pretty well, but the Russians messed up, man. They used their own tanks for the training. Turns out the dogs kept going after Russian tanks and blowing them up. So the plan was scrapped before it got off the ground. Well, I don't think you need to worry about those dogs exploding on you. They don't seem to be the bomb-carrying type. But they are highly trained in tracking and detection. Don't underestimate them. They're excellent trackers and ferocious fighters. Attack dogs move fast and are deadly in proximity encounters. They'll pick up your scent and use it to track you so it'll be hard to shake them off. In a way, they're more dangerous than any human opponent. Be prepared. Those gun emplacements are DSHKs, a large caliber machine gun officially adopted by the Soviet Army in 1939. The name DSHK comes from the initials of the two creators, Dektyarev and Shpagin, plus the Russian word for large caliber. They saw a lot of action in World War II. The Russians used them as anti-aircraft and anti-armor guns for position defense, vehicle turrets, and infantry support. The combined weight of the gun in the emplacements is almost 350 pounds, so you can forget about picking one up and taking it with you. The gun is gas-powered and capable of spitting out 550 rounds a minute on a belt-feed system, which is bad news for you when the enemy's using it. Hide behind something and lob a grenade at it, or attack it from outside the emplacement's firing angle. Either way, it's not a good idea to rush at it head-on. Or you might try using a smoke grenade to put up a smoke screen that'll cover your approach. If you manage to get close to a gun emplacement, you can take it over by pressing the action button. The weapon button controls the trigger. Beware, though, the ammo supply is limited. To move away from a gun emplacement, just press the action button again. Use it when you need the upper hand. Major. What is it? That attack chopper is parked on the heliport. The one from before? Yeah. The one that took away the Shagohod during the Virtuous mission. Perhaps it's an armed variation of the MI-8 hip. No. Some of it looks the same, but the overall shape is different. It's got stub wings, and the cockpit canopy looks like an angular greenhouse. No kidding. Then it must be some kind of new model. I've heard stories recently that the Soviets are developing a flying infantry combat vehicle. That's gotta be it. A flying infantry combat vehicle? Yeah, a transport chopper with troop-carrying capabilities. Think of it as an attack transport chopper version of France's AMX VCI or the Soviet BMP. They must be doing field tests on the initial prototype. A next-generation chopper that's a little smaller than the hip. Maybe we should call it a hind. Hmm, huh, not bad. It's cool with me. Then it's settled. We'll refer to that new type helicopter as a hind from now on. The hind you see parked at the heliport must not be ready to fly. You don't need to worry about it taking off. If you're going to destroy it, now might be your chance. You say they have flying platforms out there? Flying platforms are a type of personal VTOL aircraft. They were working on those in America too, weren't they? Yeah, back in the 50s. They were supposedly going to be used for scouting and patrol missions, as well as to spot for artillery units and transport troops into rough territory. They even got an initial prototype off the ground in 1955. 
but the thing wasn't fast enough, and there were problems with getting it to stop and turn in midair. So they ended up scrapping the project. The ones you see there were built by the Soviets after they got their hands on the American design plans. The American model used a pair of contra-rotating rotors to generate lift, but those Soviet models seemed to be using jet engines instead. They must have kept going with their research after the U.S. abandoned its own project. Now they've finally overtaken us. You gotta give them credit for sticking with it. If you get spotted by an enemy riding a flying platform, they'll go into alert phase. The flying platforms themselves don't seem to be armed, but the pilots are carrying Scorpion submachine guns and grenades. The recoil on the Scorpion is low enough so that they should be able to fire one-handed in full auto mode. That gives them some serious firepower. You seen any enemies equipped with flamethrowers? Those flamethrowers are M2s. They were first used in World War II during the invasion of Guam. The M2 uses pressurized nitrogen gas to fire a fuel mixture of napalm and gasoline. It comes in handy for torching places that are tough to secure with conventional firepower, like trenches and bunkers and pillbox enclosures. Watch out though, get hit by a flamethrower in a narrow spot like a closet or a trench and it's barbecue time. Don't wander too close to an enemy carrying a flamethrower. If you need to take one out, try sniping from a distance so the flames can't reach you. What are they doing with American-made flamethrowers, anyway? Well, like a lot of other Western weapons, those M2s were probably jacked for research purposes. But if they're actually using them, man, they must really have it in for you. What do you mean? The flamethrower is heavy, short-ranged, and can only be used for a short period of time. Not only that, but when a flame trooper gets captured, he's almost always put to death. Basically, it's a bad idea all the way around to use flamethrowers unless you're sweeping. And despite all that, they're keeping them at the ready just for you. What do you think of it? They're out for revenge. Well, you've killed three members of the Cobra unit already, so you can see why Vogan has it in for you. Watch out, though. Get hit by a flamethrower in a narrow spot like a closet or a trench, and it's barbecue time. The armored vehicle you see there is a BTR-152. The BTR-152 is an armored personnel carrier that was first developed in 1948. The design was based on the ZIL-151, a medium-sized six-axle truck. It was supposedly created primarily for use in motorized rifle divisions. Besides the standard two-man crew, it can carry up to 17 fully armed personnel in its personnel transport chamber. But stealing an armored transport and driving it around isn't part of the mission, bruh. Just leave it alone and keep going. Snake, that's an MAZ-535, a Soviet-built eight-axle tractor truck. During World War II, most of the heavy transport trucks the Soviets used were supplied by the U.S. But apparently, their performance wasn't quite up to the standards of the Soviet military. The problem only got worse after the war as the size of the Soviet strategical rocket forces grew larger. The Soviets realized they needed a heavy transport truck with excellent cross-country capability to haul their ballistic missiles. So in 1954, they started work on a new truck design over at the SKB MAZ Design Bureau in Minsk, Belarus. And what they came up with was the MAZ-535 you see there. There are a lot of variations on the MAZ-535. What do the headlights look like on that one? It's got two of them. Then it must be one of the later production models. The early ones were equipped with infrared lamps. They look like they're used for cargo transport. But you're not into auto theft, are you? Just leave it alone and keep going. Hey, those tanks look like Object 279s. Object 279s? Yep. We don't have a lot of details yet, but apparently they're a kind of heavy tank designed to operate in situations involving the use of tactical nuclear weapons. They're distinguished by two sets of double treads and a disc-shaped shield, which keep it from flipping over in a nuclear blast. Basically, the four treads widen the traction area and increase friction with the ground, while the disc-shaped shield deflects the blast above and below the vehicle. The tank is armed with a 130mm cannon. It's also got a 1,000 horsepower diesel engine, which gives it a decent top speed. As far as we knew, it hadn't been formally adopted because of the high cost of production. But it looks like we were wrong. Anyway, those don't seem to be ready for deployment yet. You don't need to worry about them going anywhere. Just keep moving. 